tips above the water You watch me drown You could have saved me But you let me down yeah. Rick, thank you. Thank uh, you. I appreciate you being here. Hey, it's, it's it's always good to have an excuse to come to Coriopolis. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, I I think that will be well received. That's Actually, you know, one, one of my shows, my it's still my favorite opening of any of my shows, Stuff That's Gone. It starts with the uh, surprise destruction of the old <laughs> Coriopolis Bridge. It blows I up. I remember. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a beautiful bridge. It was... Uh, Originally, the Sixth Street Bridge downtown, and they they floated it down the river. And, Is that true? I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, it became the Coriopolis Bridge. It was the old Sixth Street Bridge, you know, which, where the Clemente Bridge is now. Okay. Um, and then the, before that bridge, there was another bridge there, um, which was built by John Roebling, who built the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And I mean, I, I've seen uh, you know or heard engineers say that we we should have kept it and we could have kept it. It okay. wasn't like falling down or something when they replaced it, right? With the Sixth Street Bridge, which would eventually become the Coriopolis Bridge, but we had a, a very ornate uh, Sixth Street Bridge. Um, it may have been called the Federal Street Bridge at the time, I think, built by John Roebling. Okay, but you know, it's just one of those. I just odd details well, that I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> and oddly enough, I remember being a young single man and living in an apartment in Coriopolis and unaware that was happening until I heard the explosion oh. at 10 a.m. that morning. <laughs> well, I remember we, we had a crew out, and I don't know if I mean, maybe if we, if we took two cameras or whatever, but I called all the other TV stations that day and oh. said, you know, would you share your footage with us? We're going to use it and thing, and they all did. Every every station in town gave me their blow up footage. Okay, so we were able to assemble a nice thing. So yeah. you know, um, ninety three, I think, some somewhere in that ballpark. That sounds thing. about right. Um, and yeah, because yeah, we were well into it. And we were doing the follow up to things that aren't there anymore, called stuff that's gone. But uh, it's I don't think it's online unless it's you know illegally on YouTube or something. Yeah, there's like a that. lot of stuff on YouTube. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff on probably illegally on YouTube as well too. And I was disappointed in that bridge, Rick, because I, in my head, again, being a young person, not knowing, not paying attention to that stuff, I expected them to rebuild it the way it looked. Oh, no. And then I just, when it was done, there was a grand opening, and there was like, there was no supporting steel. It was just like a, a ramp. Yeah, there was, there <laughs> was, was no just, superstructure. It, was just, it a, just went across the river, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you are a South Hills resident. Is that correct? No, no, I, I, I not anymore. I no, no, up, I'm sorry. You grew up in South Hills. I grew up in yes. the South Hills. I yes. grew up in Bethel Park, mm -hmm. and uh, but when I moved back to Pittsburgh, I lived one year with my parents there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I moved away in '71, and I came back in '87. So from '87 till '88, I lived at home in the in my parents' basement, which had been <laughs> fixed up. Uh, when I was when I was in high school, my dad fixed up the basement really sure. nice, and I had. Uh, for a brief period of time, I had two foreign exchange brothers, and the three of us lived down there in the basement. That's why my dad finished his okay. big project and everything. Okay. Um, so, because three of us wouldn't have fit in the bedroom upstairs, but three of us easily <laughs> fit in. We had a big basement. Right. Um, and uh, so I lived one year there with my with my parents, and then I bought a house in Regent Square, where I still live. Okay. You... <sighs> You were encouraged to be a showman. It was naturally in you na when you were young, right? It just, it just starts way back with you. Well, it's weird. It's Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I always had an interest in that. I mean, uh, my mom was one of the founding members of Stage 62, which is a okay. the little theater group that began in Bethel Park, um, still around. I think it's uh, now headquartered in Carnegie, but, uh, you know, I, I grew up around all of that, and my mom, you know... My mom was in a play once, I, we, I remember very well, and uh, then we worked backstage and things like that. And actually, for a long time, I ran the hat check okay. thing at the at the, at the Bethel Park Junior High, which isn't there anymore. Okay. Um, but that's where uh, the early stage 62 productions were done. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I was always interested in that, and I became interested in little theater. And then I, you know, mm -hmm. when I was in high school, I was very lucky we... Uh, had a little experimental theater in Bethel Park High School okay. called Theater 400 um, with uh, Paul Moshnick, who was a legendary teacher there in Bethel Park. And 
so wh- when I went away to school, I, I knew that I would be an English major. I don't know. I just always I loved reading. Right. Um, and uh, so when I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, to start my college career, I was thinking I'd be a double major in English and theater. Um, but it didn't last long. Um, as a theater student, we had to go be fodder for uh, other classes, including a television workshop. So I'm at Chapel Hill, and on Saturdays, this television workshop would go to one of the big stations in Raleigh, okay. and they could use the studio. And we had to go be talent, you know. And so you didn't know when you went on Saturday morning, you didn't know if you'd be a newscaster or if you'd be something in a little drama they were going to stage or anything. You just went to be, you know, sure. people to that they could use however they want. And uh, I just thought the teacher of that was really good. And I okay. said, I want to take classes with that guy. And they said, well, you have to be a TV major in order to take his classes. And I said, okay. So I dropped the theater major, and I said I was a TV major, and because I really the, liked it. Because of the teacher. You because were Because of the there. teacher. Okay. Yeah, Paul Nichols. Okay. And I ended up taking many of his classes. And so when I graduated, I have a double major in English and what the University of North Carolina at that time called RTVMP, Radio, Television, Motion Pictures. Okay. Um, and... Now it's called the College of Communication, I think, like everywhere else. But uh, that's what my degree was in, and so I was interested in that. And you know, uh, I uh, I was I was always looking for a summer job that would you know <laughs> encompass some of that, and sure. I was lucky enough to find a job in South Carolina. Right, and that's how I. Was that the public television show? Yes, it was. Uh, it, was it was a public television uh-huh. station. I was just a student. Okay. So it was been the summer, the summer after my sophomore year at Chapel Hill. Okay. Um, I had been lucky enough to get a fellowship that you know at the University of North Carolina they have a program called the North Carolina Fellows. Okay. And all they do is help pay for you to have the summer job intern experience that you would really like. So you sort of don't have to take the one that shows up. You can sort of concoct something yourself. All right. And um, that's what happened. Uh, My mom sent me a thing out of the Pittsburgh paper that said Josie Carey is doing a children's soap opera in South Carolina. Um, And that's all it said. And so I figured, well, that must be public television. I remember Josie Carey, who was on Pittsburgh television when I was a kid. Um, She helped start WQED. She and Fred Rogers together co-produced... The first big program out of WQED, which was called Children's Corner, and it ran from the first day that we were on the air, which was, uh, we go on the air April 1st, 1954, but that show, I think, doesn't start uh, until like April 4th, because I think the first was a Friday, then Saturday, Sunday, and then it was Monday that they started Children's Corner. Um, I mean, and lots of Pittsburghers adored that show. It was huge. Um, it even went to NBC for a couple of seasons. Um, and uh, the first time Fred Rogers would have been on national television, but he was just the puppeteer. You never saw him. You only saw Josie. And then Josie went to KDKA for a while. For a while, she worked at both stations. She worked at KDKA and at WQED. And... Uh, then when the when she went full time to KDKA, I think Fred Rogers went to the seminary and became a minister, and mm-hmm. then, you know the rest is history. Right. Um, and anyway, Josie was involved in a children's show in South Carolina when I was in college, and I thought, oh, that sounds cool. And so I wrote her a letter, and I said, you know, hey, I remember you from Pittsburgh Television, and I'm looking for summer internship, and I think children's television may be where I want to go. Okay. And so she. She, said, called, she responded and wrote me a letter back and said, why don't you come down on your spring break so we can meet you? And that's what I did. A show called We? We! <laughs> W-H-E-E-E exclamation point. And uh, it's funny, uh, Josie wrote that, that, wrote the opening song, We Wanna Buy a Blue Balloon, Wanna drop, Fly You to the Moon. <laughs> she wrote that with Joe Negri, who's still oh, kicking around really? here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he wrote. He helped write a lot what of the talent. songs. Yeah, she... she kept that connection up with Pittsburgh so um, and I, I always love to remind Joe about that too when I see him you know <laughs> <laughs> the so. um, if my information is correct you that was the South Carolina Educational TV Network exactly right is that correct okay um, did you get a documentary called the Carolina Journal no that was a nightly show okay um, and it uh, 
What happened was, when I was in at Chapel Hill, I also wrote for the newspaper, the Daily Tar Heel, um, because I was interested, in, you know, and I started taking these television courses and stuff. But I also somehow met a lot of people that I liked from the journalism school, and so I went and took a class there on uh, reviewing. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, a critic. Wal- Walter <laughs> Walter <laughs> Shipman. Walter. Boy, I wish I could remember the professor's name because he was great. And uh, so because of that, I wrote some reviews of things. Uh, okay. I mean, for this class, you, you reviewed books, you reviewed movies, uh, theater, restaurants, everything. It was a, it was a course in reviewing. And um, I remember I reviewed <laughs> the Alice's Restaurant Cookbook. So okay. the Arlo Guthrie song. Yes, yes, um, familiar. Alice wrote a cookbook, and I reviewed that and how much fun it was and everything. And I still remember advice from it. Um, always double uh, or put extra butter, garlic, and I can't remember what the third one was. <laughs> if you have a recipe, vanilla, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, extra butter, garlic, or vanilla in any recipe that, you see, that you're going to try. Okay. Put more of those ingredients. Um, <laughs> and uh, because of that, then I ended up uh, applying for a little position at the Daily Tar Heel, and I got to be their reviewer, and okay. I started reviewing everything that I could. All those things that I had reviewed, um, but mostly, at first, mostly movies, uh, uh, but then I moved into onto theater and restaurants and things like that. And after I graduated, I was, I'd gone back to, I was working in South Carolina Mm -hmm. and a girl I'd known in college went to work for Doubleday and she called me and she said, Rick, can I put you on the reviewers list? And I said, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? And she goes, you know, okay. And you you know, they like to get copies of any reviews that you might write that would be reprinted and everything. And so like the next week I got this big box of books on my front porch in South Carolina. And they came every week. I got a box of books every week. And probably about after a month of this, I thought, I got to do something, <laughs> um, you know, to sort of earn this before they, you know, come and say, where are all those books? And uh, that's a lot of reading. It was, well, I wasn't reading them all, but it was nice to get them. Mm-hmm. So, but it forced me to call the newspaper. And I know that they did a book page in the Sunday paper. And I said, I want to review books. I get books from Doubleday. And the editor, uh, he said, well, come on over. I want to meet you. And uh, we talked for a while. And I, I took some clips from my days at the Daily Tar Heel. And uh, he said, OK, pick three books from my shelf and uh, review one of them. And you can keep the other two. And I said, well, I don't need to take any books because I get them from Doubleday. He goes, I don't want to, you know, I don't care about your books from Doubleday. Take three from my shelf. OK. And so I started that, and I just it became a regular part of my life. I was reviewing a book at least once a month, if not two or three times a month. I would be reviewing in the Sunday paper, okay, and um, getting free books from <laughs> the, the, the state. That's the name of the uh, big paper in Columbia, South Carolina, the state. And uh, one day, uh, Beryl Dakers, who was the producer of the arts program on our air at South Carolina Educational Television. Beryl Dakers came to me and she said, you know, I like reading your things in the Sunday paper. Why don't you come on my show and read them? Sort of like uh, Gene Shalit on the Today Show. I remember. And I said, oh, that'd be fun. Because I didn't have to do any more work. It was already done. All I had to do was sort of recast it to be read aloud. And they put it in the teleprompter and I would read it. Right, 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 right. And I think I did that for her like two or three times before the guy who produced the nightly show on our air called Carolina Journal came to me and said, I love those things you're doing for Barrel. Why don't you come do them on my show and you'll get a bigger audience? And so I said, cool. So I started to do that. And then I, I remember there was one I did. I, I uh, reviewed a bunch of horror movies one okay. year for, for Halloween. Okay. And that was fun. And he goes, hey, you know, you ride your bike to work every day. And I said, yeah, I do. Because it wasn't very far from where I live to the station. I said, I ride my bike every day. He goes, I want you to do a little story about that. I'll give you a cameraman and he'll help you get it edited and all that and everything. And so I did a little story about that. And I never did another review. I just started doing those little stories. Okay. Um, little stories about, you know, I, I remember I did one about, uh, I worked the crossword puzzle, the New York Times crossword puzzle every morning at Frank's Hot Dogs in Columbia, South Carolina, and things like that. And then because that first story that I did about riding my bike to work every day, I'd met a guy at the local bike shop, 
And I said, he said something about doing a century. And I said, you know, do you think I could do a century ever? And he goes, in South Carolina, anybody can do a century, a hundred mile ride. And um, I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, he said, one weekend, you know, go 20 miles. And then the next weekend, try to go 40 miles and then you'll be fine. Then you'll know what it feels like and you'll be okay. And um, so it was summertime and I did those prep rides and everything was fine. And then I, I took my little camera along that little tripod and I could set the timer and I took pictures of myself along the way. And I did a story about doing my first century ride. I drove from, or I rode from Columbia, South Carolina to uh, Charleston and uh, to the beach. I knew I was going to meet some friends at the beach. And so I rode my bike to the beach and it was really great. And things like that happened. And then I, you know, um, started yes, meeting cameramen and working with various right. cameramen on all that. And then one of them said, we should do a documentary. And that was Buck Brinson. He became a really good friend of mine. Okay. And uh, we were looking for a topic and they announced that uh, the dance called The Shag. Mm -hmm became mm -hmm. the state dance of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I did a documentary about the state dance uh -huh. of South Carolina, <laughs> which is kind of a slow jitterbug um, that started around World War II. People danced it at the beach. Um, and it uh, sort of fostered a whole genre of music that people in the Carolinas know. But I don't think uh, people outside the Carolinas are, 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 you know, if you say beach music. And in the Carolinas, beach music is old black rhythm and blues okay. that you dance the shag to. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, you heard it at the beach. And I say whoever was the guy who loaded the jukeboxes at the beach is really the man who started this whole phenomenon, although we never <laughs> found him. Um, and even to this day, if you've ever driven along the Grand Strand, which is the, you know, the unending coastline of sandy beach coastline that goes from i think north myrtle beach mm -hmm. um almost to uh merle's inlet that may, mm -hmm. maybe it's, it's over 100 miles of uninterrupted beach and it's mm -hmm. really beautiful but if you're on 17 the highway there there's one place where if you're riding along the beach road you have to come out to 17 go past and go back and that's where the black beach was which okay. was called atlantic beach okay and apparently that was where these jukeboxes started Got to it. be loaded with Got this it. great black old old black rhythm and blues right, songs right right um you know uh 60 minute man by the dominoes oh, yeah. things like that oh, you know yeah. the really really beautiful old uh songs um and occasionally there would be i remember there was a billy joel that the shagger a billy joel song leave the tender moment alone mm -hmm. that people loved and you know mm -hmm. stuff like that um so we did this documentary about the shag and um that was really fun and then uh i because i was doing that i got to go cover the um spoleto arts festival in charleston so okay Every year they have the Spoleto Arts uh -huh. Festival in Charleston. It's an international festival that started in Italy right. in the town of Spoleto right. by uh, the composer Giancarlo Minotti. And uh, so I would, I love that. I, I look forward to that every year. I did it two or three years. We would go down. You'd spend essentially a month in Charleston. Wow. Living in a motel. Um, and uh, one year, the guy who was producing Carolina Journal, we were doing Carolina Journal stories for that month. Mm -hmm. And because people in South Carolina love that festival. I mean, anybody would love that festival. And um, he said, we're having a competition. Um, the team, and there were several teams working, you know, who does best, will get a special surprise. And so I was working with Buck at that time. And uh, Buck Brinson and I won this little competition, an in house competition. And we got to go to Australia. That's for what twenty eight days. To ask you about. I found yeah. some footage of that, Rick. There's some footage out there. Of that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm very proud of that, and I I think. Uh -huh. um, so uh, we got to go twenty eight days to Australia to cover the Spoleto Arts Festival when it went to Melbourne, Australia. In in Charleston, it had always been called the Festival of Two Worlds from Spoleto, Italy, in Charleston, South Carolina. And then 1983, 84, something like that, it went to Melbourne, Australia. Right. And so then it became the Festival of Three Worlds. It didn't last in Melbourne. I don't think they still have it. They have a festival, but they don't okay. call it Spoleto. But um, we still have Spoleto in Charleston. And um, we went and did a documentary about the festival, and a 90-minute documentary. And 
Buck and I had always talked that we were going to do a little side thing about our trip. And we did a little travel log called the Slightly Wacky Aussie Daco. Yes. And, and, there's some, and, and I think he's quoted as saying, years later, that was one of the few times that you were doing stand-up within the actual video. Is that right? It was, well, yeah. With an emu? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was sort of doing stand-up when I did those old... Uh, movie and book reviews and things because i was on camera okay but yeah when i st- like in the shag you don't see me but in, in and you don't see me in the 90 minute documentary about spoleto melbourne but you do see me in the slightly wacky aussie doco because it was about our trip right yes and there's a little stand up with an <laughs> emu and uh actually I, I say in the show emu and some an australian corrected me they don't say emu. Okay. They say emu. Oh, So you have to have that, that little Y sound in there, emu, instead of emu. We want to say emu, I think, because it's just E-M-U, emu. Right. But it's an emu. And uh, Did you love Australia? Did you like it? I did. Uh, I said, you know, it was the only foreign country I've been into that I think my father would have liked. Got because it. it's it's just like America with hot a, <laughs> enough enough differences to keep you constantly uh-huh. intrigued. And I remember I remember Buck when we were driving there one time. He's we were driving uh, in the outskirts of Melbourne, and he said, "You know, if we weren't on the left side of the road, you could." convinced me that we were in Spartanburg, South Carolina. How about that? You know, because uh, American culture is so prevalent. The thing was, though, it was still nice. Uh, it hadn't quite gotten as franchised and mm-hmm. chained, you know, to chain mm-hmm. restaurants and things yet. Mm-hmm. So there was still sort of a, a that nice sort of family-owned thing. Um, and, you know, but yeah, I loved Australia. And I, I, that was there in like, I'm going to say 84. Okay. Um and then I, I think that show, the slightly wacky Aussie Daco, got me my job at QED. That was my next question. Was it that or the Shag? I wasn't. I wasn't sure which uh, one of the two. They, she looked at both of them. Nancy Lavin was the woman who hired me at QED. Okay. And she looked at both of them um, because I know that at my job interview with Nancy, she said we'll have to find something for you to do if you came here. We'd have to find something like Shag for you to do. And I said immediately, I said, well, I think I'd like to do a show about Kennywood. Okay. And she said, ooh, that amusement park. And she was from San Francisco, and she had never been to Kennywood. And I said, yeah, I said, I think it's so important to people who grow up here. Kennywood is a once a year day. It's like, you know, your school picnic is like so important. Um, It still fascinates me. I don't know if every city has that, this place that people just love, you know, and like they want to know everything about it and, um, you know, Anything you say about Kennywood, people are interested in. So, um, you know, she said that would that, and I said that I think would be like Shag. And to her credit, the next summer she said, mm-hmm. "Why don't you look into that Kennywood thing?" Um, but uh, do you remember your first project for QED? Yeah, my first project for QED was uh, a show about uh, transplants, about the <laughs> organ transplants, because mm-hmm. in 1987, <clears throat> I, I came, I started work at WQED on July 6th, 1987. Okay. I, I drove from South Carolina on the 4th of July. Um, I drove, uh, up here and then, in fact, I drove the whole, the whole thing in one day, which I now think is like a little crazy. Um, but, um, I I think someone had started this maybe, but anyway, in 1987, more organ transplants were done in Pittsburgh than in the rest of the world combined. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were the world capital of organ transplants, and this organization, TRIO, Transplant Recipients International Organization, was going to have their world conference here, and QED wanted to have something to put on the air during that world conference. And so I was, you know, given this, and uh, I called it Transplant Town. We used to be the Steel City. Now mm-hmm. we're the Transplant Town. Mm-hmm. The you know, the late '80s were not a big time in Pittsburgh. It was like things were pretty bad, and people were leaving right. in droves, right. and had already left in droves. And uh, you know, this was the thing to celebrate this whole the whole idea of doing transplants. And uh, so we put together this crazy show, and uh-huh. uh, but no, it's not crazy. It's it's a pretty <clears throat> straightforward show. I remember watching it, yeah. and uh, and the music and the sound. The soundtrack was fascinating. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, because when you're new, you don't know. You don't know how wacky you can be. Got it. So you and were testing the waters then, you think? It was testing the waters. Exactly right. Yeah. I, I just thought, um, it's funny. And I thought, I'm not going to say anything. I, I don't say anything about it in the show. I said, but somebody will be singing at home and thinking like, why is he using all this organ music? Because we used exclusively I organ know. music. <laughs> I mean, in the beginning, it's sort of almost like church music. Right. And, you know, then various other things, other kinds of organ music all the way through the show. And I thought if, if somebody gets it, they'll laugh a little and, you know, say, okay, cool. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember there was one guy at work who just hated it, who hated the whole thing and, and said there was too much music and all of that. Okay. Um, I think we won a Golden Quill, which is uh -huh. the local uh -huh. thing for it, though, because it was really good. I also remember that... Um, you know, when you do a show about organ transplants, you assume you're going to get to go and, you know, be there in the operating studio or operating room and, you know, get some shots and all that. And we had set that all up. It's quite extensive, all the, you know, releases you have to get and everything mm -hmm. and permission. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to get, you know, into... Uh, uh, the garb. The, all the garb, yeah, and the hair nets and masks and things like that. So we had to be up at like, you know, three in the morning and be at Presby at like 4.30 or something like that. And, you know, Dr. Starzl was mm -hmm. going to do the operation. It was probably a liver transplant because that was his specialty or multiple organs. Those were the things that we really were and shining in, or, uh, livers and multiple organs. Right. And uh, I'm going to say uh, probably about seven o'clock in the morning, uh, things started to get weird and it all fell apart huh. they didn't the, the the organ that was supposed to come in to be implanted was something was wrong and so they had to cancel the whole thing okay and um you know we were there with dr starzl in his office and you know all this happened and um he said i'm really hungry let's go down to the o <laughs> So I'd never been to the that O. That was great. And so I went with Dr. Starzl and my team, and we went down, you know, my my crew. And uh, Any footage of that? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think there's some in the show, oh, actually. Because, I'd love to see that. Um, when we got down there, he goes, oh, I don't have any money. He goes, I just have to find a medical student. But the O was open 24 hours then. I don't think it is anymore. I think uh, it closes for a while in the right, night. Right. But the O was open 24 hours, and he just wanted a hot dog. So we went down there. So and then later... In my career at QED, when we were doing something about, uh, boy, is it Oakland or I can't remember what what my what my topic was, but I met up with Doctor Starzl again, and uh, at that point he was go going to get donuts, and uh, so we, we went okay. to uh, the old okay. Kunst Bakery uh -huh. right there on Forbes, and it was really fun too to to with Doctor uh, Starzl and his dog Ophelia. Ophelia, yeah. So there was a uh, if if, I'm, if my information is correct, it might not be, but. I read somewhere that when you first got the QED, you had to uh, basically complete an incomplete work that was already in process about right. the rivers. That's right. That's that's my first hour long show at QED. Okay. Uh, Transplant Town was only a half hour, um, and my first hour long show, which came very quickly after that, I think, right after Transplant Town, um, was uh, the Mon, the Al, and the O. Right, and yeah. I. Uh, you changed the name, didn't you? Yeah, I think it was just called Three Rivers. <clears throat> and I, you know what? I, when I got there, I got a, you know, a pad of research. I mean, a folder full of research stuff, and I don't think anything had been shot. No, I don't think so. Nothing had been shot yet. Um, and uh, at the same time, or just that, you know, while this was all going on, Prince Charles came to Pittsburgh. Okay. And um, that was a huge event. There was an international conference here called Remaking Cities, talking about what are we going to do with all these steel mills that aren't steel, that aren't working anymore? Do we tear them down? Do we preserve them? What do we do? Mm -hmm. How can we convert them? And Prince Charles was very much involved in all of that. And, he, you know, he has a great love for traditional architecture and things like that. And so he was the keynote speaker. And uh, at the... Uh, recently redone Benedim. I think it was it was already called the Benedim, I want to say, when Prince Charles came. But this had to be 88 or 89 and uh, yeah, 87 or 88. Um, he, uh, he gave a speech and then he took questions from the audience. How about that? That's pretty cool. And somebody stood up. So, you know, it, was the, it wasn't open to the public. It was people who were there for this conference. Sure. And a guy from Philadelphia stood up and said... Oh, I hear all this stuff about the Mon, the Mon, the Mon. What about the Al and the O? 
And like, you know, Pittsburghers don't call the Allegheny the Al, and right. they don't call the O the right, O, or right, the Ohio right. the O, but I thought, oh, that's kind of fun, the Ma and the Al and the O. And that's where I got my title from, some guy who asked a question at the Prince Charles. How about that? And uh, so uh, that's my first hour-long show, and I, again, had so much fun and learned so much, and uh, that's really what my whole thing is here. I think, I, I mean, I want to be surprised. That's, you know... And you quoted as saying that, yeah. yeah that, I, I thought that was very insightful. You, you, you. That's the. You said that was your goal. Your goal was to be surprised. Always, with every still story. is. Yeah, I, I want to be surprised all the time, and you know, um, I. Well, I mean, just for instance, mm -hmm. I, I write a column for Pittsburgh Magazine every month, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be about famous Pittsburghers or famous visitors. I mean, more more famous visitors, but we stretch it a little bit. The magazine used to call it. Uh, all roads lead to Pittsburgh. N they haven't been using that for a while now, but so it's just a column uh, about history and Pittsburgh history. But um, I somehow encountered something about Pearl Mesta. Okay. Okay. Pearl Mesta uh, is the woman for whom the term hostess with the mostest was coined. She was a Washington, D.C. socialite who threw great parties. Okay, um, and I, I'm not going to remember her maiden name, um, but she married George Mesta, okay. who ran Mesta Machine in West Homestead, a huge mm -hmm. steel mill. Mesta Machine built the machines to make steel. Got so it. I mean, like they were huge. Got it. I mean, they were they they made giant pieces of equipment, um, and uh, she met him in New York City. Uh, she was, I think, from Oklahoma. Or she was living in Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, they hit it off. They get married. She comes to Pittsburgh for a while. She's not crazy about Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, then George dies pretty young. Um, he married. He was quite a bit older than her. I was going to say he was like in his 50s when she was in her 20s, and he married her, and he didn't live to 60 or something. He, he dies very young. Okay. But she's very wealthy. And she doesn't like Pittsburgh, so she moves away. She moves around, and she ends up in Washington, D.C., where she really helps Harry Truman get elected. And so then hmm. that all her connections in D.C., she's named the first uh, American minister to Luxembourg. They, we don't have an embassy there yet, so she's not the ambassador. Got but it. That's when she is known as the hostess with the mostest. Uh, Irving Berlin writes a song about her. Okay. He, I mean, he wrote a whole musical okay. about her. Um called call me madam <clears throat> you know um madam minister or whatever she was she wasn't madam ambassador but um call me madam is the musical about pearl mesta so I, I i you know but i all this didn't surprise me but then while doing research on her you know i knew and this was really one of my things was i knew she was buried at homewood cemetery even though she didn't like pittsburgh she ends up here forever got it <laughs> um she, i mean she's not buried she's entombed her, okay. her the the uh, mestas have a uh uh, mausoleum. mausoleum and uh, but in doing this research I find out that when she was in Luxembourg she would come into Belgium because at the time you there wasn't you didn't fly that much sometimes she'd take the boat she would come into Belgium and she would always stay at this uh, one hotel and the bartender there was from Luxembourg but he liked her very much she didn't drink but he named a drink for her the Black Russian now, and it, it's still a popular cocktail, but it was named, I mean, in her wow. honor. Now, wow. she wasn't a black Russian. Wow. I think it had something to do with the political situation at the time. Okay. But there's no question, if you read anything about black Russians or okay. cocktails, there's usually this acknowledgement that the black Russian How was created that? in Belgium for uh, Pearl Mesta, who lived for a while in Pittsburgh and who was buried here. So I love that surprise element. I love finding out those weird little things. And the further you dig, naturally, the more things are right. uncovered as well, too. Talk to me about Ken Conrad. Kevin Conrad. Oh, Kevin, excuse me. Kevin Conrad. Kevin I can't read Conrad. my own writing here. Yeah, he... Uh, it's funny because I remember when I came to QED, Kevin was an editor, and he was already editing things, you know, like the Mr. Rogers show, and uh -huh. he was working on National Geographic and everything, and uh, the editors are in the, were in the basement. I was up on the second floor, and uh, I don't know. They were intimidating. <laughs> I, I, you know... I assume Kevin was like, you know, 10 years older than me and all this. And I was this whippersnapper from South Carolina. Well, it turns out Kevin's about two years younger than me. But um, we've worked together since 
you know, since the beginning on mm-hmm. all kinds of shows and mm-hmm. have worked together. And then uh, at first he was pretty much an, a technical editor. He would be the final editor who would help you get the show to time and get it, you know, all the technical things correct and all of that. But then he also started editing, editing. So where he would sit in the editing room with you and help make decisions and all of that. Which has to be very tough for you, I would think. Why? <clears throat> because Because... Do you not gather a lot of information? Yeah, I do. And then you have to parse that down. And- well, you know, yeah. <clears throat> and and that's that's one of my biggest uh, tasks is is the parsing down or the you know, paring down sure. the uh, the information to figure out, okay, I like this part of the interview, so we're going to use that. <laughs> and that's basically what I do is I, I, I line up the things that I like and then try to figure out how we can make it flow. Okay. And, I don't know. I remember things that I've learned at WQED along the way. Uh, David Gerber, um, who went on to found Animal Planet, Mm -hmm. he was a producer there at QED when I was uh, new there. And something came up about the order of stories. And he he said to me, well, you always want your best story first. Because you want to grab that audience. Okay. And so, yeah, that, that, I learned that. And that's true. And and then, he, you know, he sort of went on. He said, well, you, you know, your, your best story should be first. Then you're going to have a great story at the end. And you should have a nice one in the middle. And those are your, like, you know, <laughs> tent poles. And then the, the others you can string along. Got it. Like make a necklace. Got it. Of all your other stories. Um, and, you know, uh, then within each story, there's, you know, the sound bites from people and things you want to get out and stuff like that. So... Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's a continual learning process. And the thing that, I mean, that's so great about working with Kevin is that, uh, I mean, there's no question, there's no TV show that isn't a collaboration. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, those collaborative juices, I think, are really good. And, you know, I can give Kevin something and then he'll play with it and, right. you know, put pictures on top of my narration and stuff like that and make it more fun and you know it's it's always exciting to because we don't sit together that much in the editing room uh we just uh you know i i finish something i say here's where i'm gonna go work on the next part got it got it uh, he he works on that and then we i because i don't tell him what i picture i want to see what he pictures out of all of that so and uh yeah i think it's worked no question the Besides the work for QED, you have done work for PBS, right? Well, but still yeah. for QED. Got it. But now, now, how did that was? Did PBS pick up something you were working with QED, or did you were you formally asked to present or, or to create these? Because the the hot dog show, the ice cream show, and I'm missing the last one. There were three in a row. There it was 96, 97, 90. I did my homework, Rick. Okay. <laughs> well, they, 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 were national, they were national shows, though. They, right. They were. Yeah, the first ones are ice cream and shore things about. Sure things. I, I say non-environmental reasons why people go to the beach, and then that was followed by hot dogs and amusement parks. Yes. Um, and uh, what happened was when we started making these documentaries here. Um, we would always send them to PBS. Okay. Um, which uh, was in Alexandria, Virginia. We always say D.C. We send them down to D.C. um, to PBS. And they would would look at them and they would say, "Mm, too local, too parochial, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, And then in the process of building these shows here, um, they were popular and so popular in Pittsburgh that other PBS stations in Pennsylvania started airing them. And there was, at that time, no longer exists, a group called PPTN, Pennsylvania Public Television Network. And they had some bucks, and they would fund programs. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I'll hurt anybody's feelings, but I remember Nancy Lavin, the woman that hired me, uh-huh. she always would say, oh, they're the disease of the month programs. Because <laughs> they would generally be that kind of a show sure. um, where you'd have a panel of doctors or something, and sure. people could call in and that kind of thing. Well, we proposed to them, instead of doing another one of those shows, how about if we do a little documentary that shows places across the state? And so we, I proposed doing the Pennsylvania Road Show. Right. And... Um, in the process of doing the Pennsylvania Road Show, uh, our camera broke down, and we had to borrow a camera from the PBS station in uh, Her- in Harrisburg, um, and uh, so that we ended up spending several days there. And so I was like looking for stories that we could do there and keep ourselves using their camera for three days, and we unexpectedly did a story about Lee's Diner on Route 30, which was the Lincoln mm-hmm. Highway. Mm-hmm. 
and it, that was in York. I want to say, you know, we were in that in that area over there, and sort of, it's not quite eastern Pennsylvania. It's sort of southeast, south middle Pennsylvania, right? And uh, when we showed the Pennsylvania Road Show at QED, um, we used to have these things called. Uh, Screenings. <laughs> Chris Fenimore was at the screening, and he said, I could watch a whole hour on diners. And I said, I could do a whole hour on diners. And so uh, we did that. We went then the Pennsylvania, the PPTN uh, network was really happy, and they said, you know, what else could would you think? And I said, well, Chris Fenimore suggested we might consider an hour on diners, and there's lots of diners in Pennsylvania. So they funded that, and so we did this show called Pennsylvania Diners. And that one, when we sent it to PBS, they said, you know what? It doesn't matter if you know these specific restaurants. Everybody knows this kind of restaurant. And we think people might be interested in this. And so they gave it a national airing. Okay. So that's that's the key show, Pennsylvania Diners. And um, I remember at the time, it was that era when um, we didn't have an inter yet, inter- internet yet. Um, I mean, it may have existed, but people weren't there aware right, of it. Right. Um, people would sit at their TVs and click through channels. You had a, it was the era of the I remote, remember. <laughs> and you would just like click through uh-huh. till you see something you like. Uh-huh. Well, uh, they followed the ratings across the country for the diner show, and they got really great ratings that would continually climb because people would stumble across it as they flecked through their public television station. And so then PBS at that point was really happy, and they said. Well, if you could do other shows like, you know, Pennsylvania Diners nationally, what would you do? So I made a list of 10. That's what they asked for. Make us a list of 10 shows you think you might could do like that. And um, I think we ended up doing maybe all 10. Um, I I said hot dogs, amusement Uh parks, Uh uh, flea markets. Ice cream. uh, Ice cream. Yes, all those things, the beach, ice yep. cream, you know, those are, and they, they chose ice cream and beaches as the first two. Mm-hmm. And so then we just, I and mean, we've done them ever since. I mean, my last two national shows were three years ago. I did a few great bakeries mm-hmm. and a few good pie places. Um, do you like to travel? Do you, do you enjoy the travel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I, I love that. I, I love, and, and, you know. And the food's and good, it, too. <laughs> right. And, it, and it's it still sort of astounds me that, you know, um, we do these national shows just exactly like we do the local shows, and you know we got to go some pretty great places. So I bet. Um, I mean, I always tell the story that when we were doing the hot dog program, um, we thought we were done shooting, but the grants that you get are are called reimbursement grants. You have to have receipts, sure, to get the money, sure. And I remember the person in our business office said, um, "You haven't spent enough money yet." Which, you know, you sell them here in this business. <laughs> um, he said, uh, you need to do another trip. And I said, oh. Uh, it was the middle of winter. Okay. And uh, it was probably about this time of year. And uh, the uh, actually the internet, the hot dog program is the first time we use the internet. And I was working with Nancy Coates Greenwood, um, who was my associate producer at the time. And we would... There wasn't Google yet. You had other search right. engines, you Alta know, Vista and things yes, like that. <laughs> exactly. And um, you would, we we would go to those different search engines, and see if we could top each other with finding cool hot dog places and stuff Got like it. that. Got it. She found a place in Anchorage, Alaska, I a guy who had a, a, he had a website for his push cart. I mean, at the time to have a website for your business was pretty That's cutting pi- edge, pioneering. Yeah. Yeah. And for your push cart, <laughs> you have a web you have a website for your push cart, and so um, we laughed about that and blah blah blah. Right. And uh, when this guy said I, it was the middle of winter, I said maybe we'll go like to Florida or to. I knew that Someplace they had those big warm. hot dog carts down in New Orleans. And right. Nancy said, "What about uh, in Alaska?" And I said, "Oh come on, he's not <laughs> selling hot dogs in Alaska." <laughs> and she said, "I still have his uh, email address. Can I send him an email?" And I said, "Sure." Send him an email. Well, he writes back that he does not sell hot dogs in the winter except for one day, the day the Iditarod dog sled race begins. How about that? So we thought, like, oh, <laughs> that's so good. Hot dogs, <laughs> cold dogs, dog race. Um, and so we decided we would go to Alaska, and we went to, to Anchorage for the opening of the Iditarod. And 
I, 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 I would honestly say that I think I had very little desire to go to Alaska. <laughs> but I loved it intensely. It was wow. so incredible. I, just, I mean, uh-huh. I just, I totally fell in love with Alaska. People say that the first time they go. Whoa. Um, so, I mean, we've gone back twice since right. then. Um, I went back for my cemetery show. Um, we went to Fairbanks that time. A little even further north. Even further north. And um, then uh, for Pies and Bakeries, we went to Juneau. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I felt somewhat justified because some people in the PBS system said, oh, I always love the fact that in your national shows you include Hawaii and Alaska because we often forget that, oh, yeah, they're part of America sure. too. Sure. So, um, but, yeah, no, I, I love Alaska. And then I, in the cemetery show, I love the fact that in the rest of the United States, if you go into a cemetery, the headstones will say born, died, you know, with the two dates. In, in Alaska, pretty much all the gravestones have born, came to Alaska, died. Oh, really? So that's the third date in the middle of most people's lives there is when they came. Because most people in Alaska are not natives. Right. I mean, there are natives. And, right. we, and we did a native story mm-hmm. because I said that was one of the things we had to do was uh, to do a thing about the Native Americans in Alaska. So, and... Uh, <laughs> It's really great. <laughs> you coined its phrase, which you, you know, I don't know if, if you think that you coined it, but it seems like you did. Sc- is it scrapbook? Scrapbook documentaries. Documentary? Yeah, I know yeah. that I get credit for that. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I said that's in, especially in the beginning. That's really what they were. Is we were, and they still are. I love to f- look for old pictures, and I mean, right now I'm writing proposals. I'm trying to put sure. together a big proposal, and I'm you know. Uh, I happened to be in my office and I saw a stack of postcards and I thought, oh, I wonder what's there. And now I'm looking for old pictures of people on the road or um, postcards of, you know, old highways and that kind of thing. Um, Because that's what I'm proposing to PBS is that we do a couple of shows or four shows on numbered highways. Okay. Um, uh, National numbered highways and state numbered highways. Um, I just finished doing eight shows that I called Nebby. Right, and the first one is a, a short history of Route eighty eight, and I love that. I mm-hmm. love learning. I mean, I grew up right off Route eighty eight, mm-hmm. and I, I had never driven to Point Marion, which is the end of mm-hmm. Route eighty eight down there at the West Virginia border. So I, I love that, and actually, I love it when I'm out and about now. When people say to me, "Oh my God, I love that Route eighty eight show," because <laughs> um, yeah, it's just it, it. If if you're inclined towards that, I think it's it's really it shows you kind of the fun you can have discovering things along any highway um in fact you know coming here to Coriopolis today your address is route 51 i know and so i got the sign behind me there 51 <laughs> oh, all right found yeah. that at a flea market and i have had it for so long i thought this will fit well with the studio yeah no no i mean and 51's a, 51 is a good candidate um really yeah yeah i mean although route six across the top of pennsylvania is um i've traveled that road yeah, that it's uh, the Grand Army of the Republic uh-huh. Highway. Uh-huh. Um, well, you know, a couple of years ago we did a show on um, the Lincoln Highway, mm-hmm. which was the first highway to cross the whole country. It went from Times Square in New York City to Lincoln Park in San Francisco, and so uh, for that I got to drive it in a QED van <laughs> um, with my crew, a crew of two. Okay, um, and we drove twice the whole length of America. Um, and uh, one time we went, it, it was kind of weird. We, we wanted to see, um, there, there are parts of the Lincoln Highway, especially out west, that still aren't paved. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's one, um, oh, I wish I could remember. It's, it's, in, uh, uh, it's in Nevada. No, it's in Utah. Okay. It's in Utah, and it's Tooele. Tooele, Utah. Tooele. That's the name of the town. Um, and the Lincoln Highway used to go through there. It doesn't anymore. I mean, the Lincoln Highway never built a highway. They just identified routes. Got it. And connected and then them. In 1926, when the federal government decides that highways are going to have numbers, mm-hmm. uh, they name most of the Lincoln Highway as 30. But it's not all the way. So, but there and there are old routes of uh, things, and at, at Tooele there is a. Uh, did you stay on the old routes as you went, or did we you... did sometimes? We would try to get off and see okay. things. Yeah, okay. Because there are places I know in Wyoming where Interstate 80 is on top of the old Lincoln Highway. How about that? So you have to be on the interstate to follow the route of the old Lincoln Got Highway. It. Got it. Um, but in in Tooele there's a uh, the the 
Dugway Proving Grounds or something. It's a it's a place <laughs> where they you know test you know unspeakable things. Yes, um, yes. For the government and everything, and uh, we think. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Um, and the Lincoln Highway used to go right through the Dugway Proving Grounds. Okay. So you can't take it anymore. Um, one time, the Lincoln Highway Association got special permission to just drive through. They weren't allowed to stop, um, just to take the old road. But if you don't, if you get to the Dugway Proving Grounds, there's like a dirt road to the side that uses the old Pony Express Road. Oh my! And it goes south of the Proving Grounds and then reconnects with the old Lincoln Highway. And you route. drove that in a van. We drove that in a van. <laughs> uh, we saw wild horses. I bet. Um, but we were heading to Fish Springs. Uh, Utah, which is like a, I don't know if it's a state park or a national park, of a, 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 a wildlife preserve. And uh, we had a flat tire and, you know, there was all <laughs> kinds of things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and so we spent the night there um, in the, in the, in the uh, ranger's quarters. Um, he was nice enough to let us stay there because we'd had this flat tire and he helped us change our flat tire. But we were on a little donut tire. Oh, my. And so... A dirt quest, road. On a dirt road. And the question was, do we follow the Lincoln Highway, which goes over the mountain, or do we take the southern route, which would keep us on the flat? And I, I, was, I was fighting for the, let's, let's take the Lincoln Highway and take our chances. <laughs> We're heading for Ely, Nevada. And uh, Bob, my cameraman, was adamant. He said, no, we're going to stay on the low road. And so we, we did. We stayed on the low road, and you know it was flat, and... Uh, we followed the dirt road as far as we can. Then you come, when we got to the paved road, mm -hmm. it was Route 6. It was oh, the road from... How about that? Uh, it was the Grand Army of the Republic Highway. How about that? Way out there. And I said, this is the, this is Route 6 from the top of Pennsylvania. Right. And I think, and those kinds of things I love. I, and I love the way highways can connect all those things. So. Did you plot out where you were going to stop or did you kind of make it up as you went away, just the interesting places that you ran into? Uh, both. Okay. I mean, we would usually have certain things that we knew we had to be certain places. I think both of our trips... Uh, uh, no, maybe just the second trip included the Lincoln Highway Conference, okay. um, which was held in Wyoming that year, I want to say. And we had to be there for that. So, you know, out to the West Coast. And uh -huh. then on the way back, we stopped for the Lincoln Highway Conference. Um, and uh, it's, you know, that old kind of, you know, Sunday driving. I, I love all of that. And uh, actually, I've been reading, too, about... Uh, I think the first show about numbered highways would probably be about the whole, you know, history of all of this. Right. And some of that includes uh, the group known as the Vagabonds. Okay. And they were um, a group of very prominent Americans who every year would take a road trip um, in in the 19 teens, um, so over a hundred years ago. Um, roads would not have been numbered yet. Okay. But the vagabonds were Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, uh, Harvey Firestone from Firestone Tires, um, and uh, a naturalist named John. It's not John Muir. I always want to say John Muir, but it's not him. But it's another naturalist writer. Okay. And they would travel all around. I, I wrote it up for Pittsburgh Magazine because one year they started in Pittsburgh. How about that? And they spent the first night in Greensburg, and then they had some car troubles, and... Uh, Henry Ford fixed the car. <laughs> I'm not in, surprised. In a, right. Um, but they ended up, they, they tried to camp all the time. They, they were, you know, oh my auto, gosh. auto campers. These leaders of industry. I mean, they were very fancy campers. I, I mean, they, they were followed by extra vehicles that had all their fancy <laughs> tents and things. Um, but the second night, they ended up staying at the uh, Summit Inn on Route 40 yeah. um, as they were heading south. It wasn't Route 40 yet. It was the National Road. Right, right. Um, but they still have a... In in the Summit Inn down there by Uniontown, they still have the uh, uh, the ledger okay. from the hotel where all these guys have signed. Okay, you know it's outside the bar, and when you walk <laughs> in, you can see that you know Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and all those guys were there. So the, and there's a new book out now called The Vagabonds. Was, That's what they call themselves. Was that trip the most involved? What would be the most involved documentary that you completed? Whether it's time related, the amount of cities, the amount of the amount of locations that you filmed that, huh? Editing. Well, I would say you know, obviously it's it's a little more complicated with the national shows because we we never have enough money to go scout locations first. 
So okay. I'm really relying on my gut and internet reviews sure. and things like that sure. to tell us, okay, this is a, a good place to go. Um, and um, so any one of the national shows, I mean, the Lincoln Highway, the highway was our, our subject. So anything along the highway was game and we would Got stop. It. Got it. Um, and sometimes we didn't know. Sometimes we'd have a whole day and um, maybe we'll stop. Maybe we won't. Um, quickly, we realized we had to make some time, though. You still have to make sure. two to 300 <laughs> miles a day in order to get yourself across the country uh -huh. eventually. Um, but uh, I would say the national shows, uh, pies and bakeries was pretty complicated. Um, and uh, a little bit of it is just I, I, I've been to 48 of the 50 states. So uh, I, I I have two states left that I haven't been to. And what are they? They are North Dakota and Idaho. And Idaho? Yeah. Huh. So those are my... And, you know, if I get to do another national show, I'll look for a yeah. numbered highway. <laughs> Where you can get there. Well, they would have a reason to be there, yeah. Um, and, uh, well, actually, I know in Pies and Bakeries, that's... Uh, that's why we ended up at Lula's in Whitefish, Lula's. Montana, because I hadn't been to Montana yet. Whitefish. Whitefish. And that's right up by Glacier. Uh -huh. I mean, it's literally, it's not 10 miles from Glacier National Park. We didn't go. It was it was, wow. it was was the middle of winter. It was, you know, the roads were not great. Uh -huh. All of that. We, we had work to do. We went and we did the pie story. We never even went to the National Park. So, um, you know. Sometimes you just don't have time. I remember when we went, we did a show called uh, Unusual Buildings all mm -hmm. across the country. And mm -hmm. we went, looked at strange buildings. And we went to the uh, Corn Palace in Mitchell, South Dakota. And I said, hey, we're going to South Dakota. We'll go see Mount Rushmore. And then, you know, when I get to Mitchell and we're there and are on our way and I look and see, it's like 400 miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big state. <laughs> <laughs> to get to Mount Rushmore. I said, we're not going to Mount Rushmore. We don't have the time nor the money to get there. I just assumed, hey, if we're, you know, we're yeah. going to be in South Dakota, we'll right get to down Mount the road. <laughs> but well, I didn't see it then. I have since been back and have seen Mount Rushmore and, and I say it's worth it. Do you, and, do you, uh, is, is each experience working on a national show or working parochially here in Pittsburgh? Is there what is there more joy in one or the other? Or are they both so unique that you, you enjoy them probably equally? Um, I, yeah, I enjoy them both equally for for you know different reasons. Okay. I mean, yeah, the best thing about my job is it changes constantly. Right, I'm I'm always meeting new people and right. going out and about. Uh, the thing uh, as far as national shows versus the local shows, I said people like the national shows, but no one loves a national show the way Pittsburghers love a local show. Got it. And you know, and uh, it's just you know. Pittsburghers love this city, and uh, you know it's it's fun to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, there's a lot of the bad things you can say about Pittsburgh, and we have some problems and that kind of thing. But basically, I think there's a lot that people like about here, and you know, the topography, the neighborhoods. You know, speaking of that, my friend, talk a little bit about Pittsburghese. Pittsburghese. Well, you know, <laughs> it's it's funny. It's I, it's, it's shifting. I. I, I when I did my show uh, Pittsburgh A to Z, Y mm -hmm. is for Yins, mm -hmm. and that's when I I probably paid more attention to it. Um, and uh, Barbara is it Bluestone, she she teaches it. I'm, I'm always concerned about her. I, I can is it Barbara Bluestone, Barbara Johnstone? She teaches at CMU. Okay, and she's written books about Pittsburghese. Right. And but she's also thought a lot about it, and I you know understand you know, like she said, it's it's a uh, it's sort of like a demonstrable difference about Pittsburgh. You know, if someone's considering a move Pittsburgh. Hey, you know, like they even have their own way of talking. <laughs> it's a plus. It's you know anything that you can make where you live distinctive. I always quote. There's a, a detective novel called The Last Goodbye. No, oh, The Last Goodbye is Raymond Chandler. The Long Goodbye. Um, uh, Crumley is the name of the... Uh, Richard Crumley. I'm, I'm forgetting the name okay. of the book. But anyway, in, I, I always quote the book is at a bar, somebody says, it doesn't matter where you live anymore because everywhere is the same. Hmm. And I said, my whole career is to try and disprove that. And you have. You know, uh, to that there are little things that distinguish everywhere mm -hmm. and you just got to look a little harder. You just, you can't stop at the McDonald's. You have to go and take one step farther. 
Well, you've been described as being a, a journalist and a documentary maker who is s- constantly searching for the distinctive. Right. Exactly. It, would that be a fair assessment? I, I like that very much. Yes. Yeah. I. Uh, you know. Um, I didn't set out to do this, but I now can look at what I've done over my thirty. It'll be thirty <laughs> thirty two years. 33. Time flies when you're having fun, my friend. This is 2020. It'll be 33 years this year. Right. I've been a QED. Um, my shows collectively are a celebration of small family-owned businesses. Mm-hmm. I mean, even when we did Kennywood, it was a family-owned sure, business. Absolutely. It's not anymore. Right. Right. Um, but you know, uh, all these things are. I, I love celebrating that, and uh, it's something that public television can do that you know other stations probably aren't going to do. Absolutely. Um, you know, to find a little pie place in Western Virginia mm-hmm. that, you know, is just so amazing. Mm-hmm. They don't have the money to put out TV ads right. or anything right. like that. Right. But we can give them some exposure and some more business and maybe keep them alive a little longer. Mm-hmm. Um, I often tell the story of Amel's in Rankin, which is one of my favorite restaurants mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, I was taken there by a guy who wrote for Pittsburgh Magazine. And uh cuz he said we're going to have the best fish sandwich in Pittsburgh and you know that's saying a lot and I said okay um but I I, I do love Amel's it's an old steelworker bar right. in Rankin right. not the best neighborhood but um the uh one day we pulled in there and we got out and a guy in a pickup truck was getting into a pickup truck next to me and he goes hey aren't you that guy from channel 13 and I said yeah and he said <laughs> you you ever tell anybody about this place I'll kill you <laughs> he wanted it all to himself. Well, yeah, he just didn't want it to change, and I, and I kept that in mind for several years. I'm sure. But then you I did. realized, you know, it, it, you you can't have that attitude because it has to grow and it has to keep. Uh-huh. It has to be, uh, you know, profitable in order to stay alive. So, it, is Pittsburgh really about the neighborhoods? Do you think? Oh, I think I think that has a huge thing. I mean, because even though we love Pittsburgh, we also have a special affection for our neighborhood. We do, you know. We and, do, we do. Um, and and uh, <laughs> you know, it's. Uh, I, I grew up in Bethel Park. I have tons of love for Bethel Park. Sure. And uh, I, you know, live in Regent Square now, and I can chat that up too. Uh-huh. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, when I was in high school, I, I got to be a foreign exchange student to Brazil. How'd that go? It was great. It was excellent. Um, what, that, part of, what part of Brazil? I was in Rio. For, oh, well. Hmm. I was in Rio for three months. Um, <laughs> in the 70s? Uh, in 1970. Yeah. In 1970, that, I was in Rio. I'm sure that was a great time. It was. I got there on a Thursday, and on Saturday or Sunday, Brazil won the World Cup for the third time. How about that? They were the first country to win the World Cup three times. Okay. Three campeón do mundo. And... The city just exploded. I mean, it was like an unexpected carnival. And uh, I, the colors alone there. Oh, oh my God! My, my family didn't speak English very much, and you know, I, my brothers just said, "Come with us. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll keep you safe." Um, and it was it was incredible. Um, anyway, um, I started to tell this because. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, it's all, not pro, uh, the parochial nature of our neighborhoods and the love of just the, uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't remember the what The tapestry gonna... of our our little co- mini cultures within the city to some yeah. degree. Hey, well. Oh, Brazil's amazing. Though. I lost my train of thought. That's okay. That's what happens. I, I, I have a couple questions for you, sir. Okay. Um, is it true that you were actually impeached as the president of the French <laughs> club? <laughs> In high school, yes. <laughs> I was the impeached president of the French club. Is that I never true? went to the meetings. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's in the, it's in my yearbook. <laughs> and you were also part of the forensic team. Mm. Is that right? A forensic club? Is that what it was? The National Forensic League. I, I, I think that probably still exists. What is, so um, that's I have debaters. no idea. What is they're, they're debaters, but I wasn't a debater. Okay. I mean, when you hear about, you know, debate competitions, they're not usually run by the National Forensic League. Um, a bit that I got a a letter in high school that said NFL, <laughs> the <laughs> National Forensic League, um, and um, uh, they had extemporaneous speaking. I did that. I think the first year that I was involved, and then um, they had a thing called uh, dramatic readings where you had to play at least three characters, 
and do a little section of a play or something like that. And so I started doing that. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that was high school. That was just know. couldn't make those French meetings, could you? <laughs> no, I was too busy with the uh, National Forensic League. In '87, you did a a documentary. I, I believe I can call it a documentary on Fred Rogers. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course. Yeah, yeah. No, I was new at QED. I'd done the Transplant Town, mm-hmm. and I'd done the Three Rivers show. It was 1987. We knew that 1988 would be the 20th anniversary of Mister Rogers' Neighborhood on the air and um i mean it was still being produced at the time it's produced until uh, 2000 i think to the uh, year 2000 right um fred passes away in 2003 mm-hmm. um but uh i was assigned to do a show about mr rogers which was kind of a plum assignment for the new guy you know sure and uh so uh it was to be an hour-long sort of celebration of Fred Rogers and all of that. And um, I started doing research. I had this, you know, weird advantage that I had worked with Josie Carey mm-hmm. in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And she had been Fred's original partner. So, And while I worked with Josie, I actually was a couple of puppets on her show. So Fred and I had that in common. We had both been... We had both run puppets that talked to Josie. So that was kind of a nice, you know connector and all of that and i interviewed a lot of people around fred first and then uh, leading up to a a long interview with fred um which we did uh in an apartment he kept on ellsworth avenue right and i don't know whether i never know whether that's north oakland or shady side or what um but uh i think shady side tries to claim it the cathedral mansions is the name of the building Mm -hmm. it's one of those big old I, sort of like grandmother mm-hmm. uh, apartment buildings. And uh, I interviewed Fred for about three hours. Uh, yeah, uh, three hours there talking about anything that sort of struck my fancy. So, mm-hmm. um, and uh, we put that show together. We called it Our Neighbor Fred Rogers. Um, I narrated it. It was part of, you know, what we were trying to do with local programming at QED at the time. Um, PBS liked it. Um, they said they would take a national version of it, but they wanted to have a a recognizable voice. They didn't want my voice. Huh. Um, oh, I mean, I, it was totally understandable. I wasn't a, a known commodity locally or nationally at the time. And um, so uh, they we, we checked out some things, and we used uh, David Hartman, mm-hmm. who was uh, then the host of Good Morning America. Right. Right, and uh, he said he loved what Fred did. I think he even claimed to know Fred, but I always, I always questioned that. Okay, because <laughs> okay. he he couldn't say, "I like you just the way you are." He had to like, "I like you just the way you." Are. No, 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 no. You have to say it sort of like Fred does. So, I like you the just inflection. the way you are. No inflection. Mm-hmm. It's very flat. Right. I like you just the way right. you are. Right. And it was, I like you just the way. No, no, no. You can't. You can't. You know, spice it up. You have to leave it flat as can be. Um, and so we made that. That was also called our neighbor Fred Rogers. Mm-hmm. Um, but that interview that I did with Fred remained like the longest interview that was around for a long time. I mean, still. Um, and uh, it, it was done at a time in his life when he looked great. And, you know, he, 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 he as Nancy Lavin, the woman who hired me at QED, said, uh, he's become a grandfather, which makes it better. Got that it. A grandfatherly figure rather than, Got it. you know, a young man doing this thing. Um, and, uh, I, you know, Fred was a very thoughtful, wonderful guy, and so it was interesting to interview him and to mm-hmm. ask him questions about his growing up and mm-hmm. Latrobe and all of that. But um, then when he died, uh, they we took that national show, the national version of Our Neighbor Fred Rogers, and redid it. Um, I got to go to L.A. and we used Michael Keaton as the narrator because Michael Keaton had worked on Mr. Rogers' right. Neighborhood, right. and um, and then uh, several versions of it done. Then then it was called Fred Rogers' America's Favorite Neighbor, but it includes a lot of the same interview, mm-hmm. and it includes you know 
some new things, uh, interviews with other people. I mean, as as did the the national version. I remember the national version because we had more money. We were able to get some clips. We got to. I didn't interview Eddie Murphy, but we got the Eddie Murphy clip from Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. Because I know it's hard to believe it, but in the late eighties, like that, that's the way a lot of people knew him. Is people making fun of him? Right. Dan Aykroyd made right. fun of him. Right. Um, you know, people know that they were mocking this guy on PBS, Mister Rogers. Mm-hmm. Um, and Eddie Murphy's, I think, are the most brilliant. And right. David Newell, who was Mr. McFeely and who was right. Fred's PR guy, tells the story about Fred meeting Eddie Murphy at Saturday Night Live. Um, Fred was there for for another show, and they said, hey, you know, they're up there at Saturday Night Live. I bet they'd like to meet you. And uh, so... Uh, the Fred of a sense of humor? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, I always remember in my show, I interviewed, like, the guy that was the director, and he said, you know, people always say, is, is he like that in real life? And he said, he is... But with an adult sensibility, it's not. He doesn't talk to you like a kid. Right. And actually, I think that now looking back, because last year in 2019, I did a show called My Interview with Fred, where right. I tried to use some pieces of the interview, either longer pieces or pieces that had never appeared before. Um, and Fred is talking to me as an adult. Mm-hmm. It's it's not mm-hmm. Fred from the show. Mm-hmm. He's definitely an adult. He laughs. And I said that, you know, he doesn't laugh much on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. No. no. But he laughs in this thing and, you know, um, stuff like that. And he plays with his ventriloquist dummy and, <laughs> and, and all that, you know. And so, uh, you know, that then, I don't know, five years ago, the people from Hollywood that were doing uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, the documentary about Fred, they right. they got a copy of my interview and they used extensive pieces of it. Mm-hmm. There's even a piece of it in like their trailer, which mm-hmm. I always thought was, that's pretty nice. That's very you know? cool, huh? Yeah, to use uh, stuff from our interview. Um, but uh, then you know, at last year, I, I, I looked back at it, you know, um, because in 2018, in August 2018, I fell and ruptured my quadriceps tendon. Oh my! That's that's why I um, was sort of not mobile Got it. the way I used to be, Got it. and uh, I, I started looking for things, projects that I could do that were principally editing. And so, sure, I did two extra Kennywood documentaries uh-huh. for my Nebby series, and I did uh, my interview with Fred. You and feeling better now? Feeling okay? Um, I wouldn't say I'm a hundred percent. And you're getting there. Since I in November I stopped therapy, uh, they sort of kicked me out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I had a year's worth of therapy three days a week, so I, I had a lot of therapy. Um, but uh, no, it's it's not back to totally normal. But you know, I'm an old guy now. Before you leave, um, two things. First, I'd like to ask you, do you have any memories about two local amusement parks that were uh, important to me selfishly when I was a kid, and that was Westview and White Swan? I never went to either one. Okay. Um, I knew Westview um, because uh, my uncle had a cottage at Prima Tuning, and there was no Interstate 79 when I was a kid. You would take 19 north and um, see, everything is highway related. Right. Um, and when you went I up 19, uh, you would go, we would go past White Swan. I mean, we would go past uh, Westview and we would pray that we would get the light. There was a stoplight <laughs> there. Because if we got the light, you could watch the, you know, uh-huh. maybe the, uh-huh. uh, what's the big thing? The big coaster there was called Leap the Dips, I think. I think it was a Leap something, yeah. Yeah, Leap yeah. the Dips. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, I never walked around Westview until it was at Kmart. Um, Got it. And, Got it. Uh, the uh, White Swan, I remember seeing because they had a wild mouse. Mm hmm. And I remember that. And um, there's a guy that used to work at QED who now has a antique store in Castle Shannon, uh, John Seekings. He has mm-hmm. always said I should do a show about West uh, White Swan. And, I, I don't know the, if there's <laughs> a bunch of people like you who remember White Swan. <laughs> I think we remember it, but I don't know if we have the history of the whole thing, too. Right. Yeah, but I remember it was, I don't know, it was, that's right there along the Montour Trail. Right? There's no question. I don't, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And it was, and I think for people in the, uh, that grew up in the airport area here, that was uh, certainly a big a draw. Right. And I think some things, th- those parks were special, and Mike children didn't have the ability they love Kennywood but I'm saying that to have like a little smaller regional right. you know, park like that was something special I wow think. there were so there, there were 
So many of those uh, you know, really? smaller amusement parks so all, all over the area. I was not aware of that. So you... Not not in your era. Oh, okay. I mean, in earlier eras. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, before television and all that, there were a lot more amusement parks. Got it. Um, Got it. So, yeah, there was one out like in Murraysville. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. I, I remember going to Zelianople and then heading uh, west from Zelianople. Uh, I can't remember the name of the town there, but there was an amusement park, and there's still uh, pieces of it back in the woods you can go okay. see. Um, well, and the last part of this piece is um, I want to thank you personally <laughs> for being here, and I also want to let you know how much you mean to my family, but more importantly, I, I feel comfortable speaking for the people of, of Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh region that you are a treasure my friend and you are the historian and the documentarian the documentary a documentarian if i'm correct documentarian right? documentarian there you go um and the spokesperson for pittsburgh and what well, and everything that's good in this town and i i know your humility will not let you accept that but i want to i want to say it publicly because that's how much i believe you mean to this region well i thank you very very much and you know i i will tell you that um nothing makes me happier then, like when someone stops me and said, "Hey, you know, I, I just moved to Pittsburgh," and a, and a librarian said, "Well, you should look at these videos," mm-hmm. and and you know, um, and actually, it comes at unusual times. I, I there's a little Asian place in uh, Casty Village in Whitehall mm-hmm. where I stopped after a doctor's appointment. My doctor's in Casty Village, and um, these two women. As I walked in to sit down, they were walking out. They went, "Oh, you're, you're Rick Sivak from Channel 13." I said, "Yeah." They go, "We love Route 88. And we, <laughs> we 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 just went and did the whole thing. We drove all the way to you know Point Marion, that? and that, that's that makes me so happy." And people who say that you know when they got here, they learned about the city from me, mm-hmm. from my shows. Mm-hmm. I, I I truly love that, and uh, you know. Um, Actually, on that visit to my doctor last week, he said, you know what? He said, we watched the... On Sunday afternoons, they run my shows often on QED. Sure. And um, they... uh, He said, oh, my wife and I watched 25 things I like about Pittsburgh. He goes, you know, I've been thinking a lot about... You know, maybe we should think about moving to a place that's warmer and blah blah blah. And he goes, and then I watch one of your shows. And I think, no, I want to stay here in Pittsburgh. And I thought that's really that, nice. Now that is amazing. That's really that's nice. that's a heck of a compliment. You deserve yeah. it, my well, friend. I don't know if I deserve it, but I do know that Pittsburghers appreciate a commitment and longevity. And if you stay here a long time and you get the privilege of keeping to keep working, all of that, you're going to get some sort of you I think know, it also success. you're missing two important parts I think that you do amazing work and you're extremely authentic and genuine I think you need to have that stuff as well too and you well, certainly cool. have that thank sir. you thank you so much and I'd love for you to come back and see me again whenever all right all thank right. you Rick I thank appreciate you. it Eric thank you Rick see back salute done done mm. what'd you think I, it was great it was easy I talked too much Oh um, my gosh! I th- I I I think it was tr- tremendous. And I didn't even see any flame tips above the water. You watch me drown. You could have saved me, but you let me down. Babe.